Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Or good evening, everybody, should I say. We are now into the evening. I'd just like to thank everybody for attending. I'd like to thank all our speakers who have taken the time out to join us on this call for this um, debate regarding the proposed coal mine. Um, and I'd like to thank all our guests for joining us on this rather lovely sunny Thursday evening. It's really great to see that you've taken the time out to come and, and join and listen to our speakers and possibly maybe pose some, some questions. So my name is Nicola. I am the secondary program manager um, at the Centre for Leadership Performance. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the centre, our mission is to develop Cumbria's leaders for today and for tomorrow. One of the reasons that we, one of the ways that we develop Cumbria's leaders for tomorrow is through um, engaging with young people in a range of programmes. Um, and my responsibility at the centre is to oversee um, a range of those young people's programmes, sort of secondary school, all the way up to their early careers at the age of kind of 25, 26, when they become sort of young professionals. The way that we do that is by providing meaningful opportunities to engage with local businesses and employers. We also provide, through our Cumbria Future Leaders, a bit of a plug in place that brings together youth organisations, young professional networks, young people, educators, businesses to, to come together to talk about the opportunities that are available and provide information and also to provide a platform for the youth voice and that's really where this has come from today. Hello yeah my name is Andrew Bernard but everyone calls me Bernie because I asked them to. Um, I've been involved with the Dream Placement which was the kind of genesis of the Cumbria Future Leaders project from the very start which has emerged into the kind of alumni legacy project uh, Cumbria Future Leaders which is about supporting young people across the whole county um, to develop their skills and their kind of ambitions and their future plans. In order to really capture the voice of young people, we weren't speaking to 18 year olds. So we decided this year to start talking to 16 to 18 year olds to get their opinion, to find out what happens at sixth form, what happens at FE colleges, and also to grab their voices so that we can make sure that they're being listened to. Because let's face it, the whole future belongs to them. So in order to, to make sure that we do that, we started the 16 to 18 group in February this year. And we've got a number of our members on the um, on the, on the the uh, call tonight. And I'm going to introduce you to Karenza Cohen in a minute, who's one of our members who's been part of the group from the start. Um, but I just wanted to kind of give you a broad idea of how it started. We basically opened the door and said, look, this is what we want to do. Are you interested? meeting after we had about three meetings and then eventually we we coalesced around well the young people facilitated by us coalesced around three major major features one local government's representation and the need to understand how local decisions are made campaigns and understanding how to ensure young voices can be heard and also um, more generally life skills and what kind of skills you're going to need in the future like someone said changing a tire and applying for a mortgage so um, th and this is the first one of those uh, discussions because obviously the coal mine is very topical um, it's a great discussion point as Chris was saying earlier I was on the radio talking about it this morning um, it's a very popular and very contentious issue so the young people wanted to get their voice across so Without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Carenza, who's going to um, introduce um, herself and also from the young person's point of view, what her views are and, and what she's, what, why she's involved. Thanks, Carenza. Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to the debate today um, on why uh, is the um, proposed coal mine board all bad for Cumbria? Um, like we've, we're here today to hear from all our speakers and explaining whether they're for or against the plans, basically. Um, and then we want to hear from the young people in Cumbria, such as myself and the rest of the 16 to 18 group, um, and their ideas on the mine plans. Um, within the 16 to 18 group, we feel that younger people are generally not listened to as much um, when it comes to bigger decisions that affect our future. Um, that's why the debate is happening today, so our views and concerns can be heard and not dismissed as too often happens. Um, we, gen we are generally dis disregarded as the social media generation that gets their um, information from a lot of fake news and just random social media sites. Um, when in reality, most of our information comes from our teachers and our classrooms and conferences that we hear about and attend and the world that we see unfold in front of our eyes every day. Um, we all have different views and opinions on different matters and we all think differently about what should be happening. 
but we rarely get to air our opinions out in public because we get disregarded that much. Um, and Your Voice Thursday is a platform for us to air our views and ensure that they are heard in a safer environment than normal publicity. Um, we campaign to get this debate off the ground for that purpose, to educate ourselves and others, um, to listen to people's point of views and to um, voice our own opinions on stuff that matter to us. So that's kind of um, a brief description of the 16 to 18 group. Um, so yeah, welcome to the, the debate and I'll hand over now. Okay, I think that's my cue. Thanks, Carenza. That was a brilliant introduction. And thanks, Bernie. And thanks, everyone, for turning out on such a sunny afternoon. Now, we need to get into chatting about what, what we're here for. So I will introduce the speakers. Um, we've got six speakers tonight. Um, their order of speaking is dictated by the alphabet. And we're doing it one in favour, one again, so you don't have all on one side and all of the other and switch off before you reach the end. So the order in which they will be speaking, just a reminder to our speakers, is John Coughlin from TSP Engineering, Giles Archibald from Lib Dems, uh, he's a councillor and also an environmental activist, Trudy Harrison, MP for Copeland, Maggie Mason from South Lakes Against Climate Change, Mike Starkey, he's the elected mayor of Copeland, and Rebecca Willis, Professor in Practice at Lancaster Environment Centre. Now again, as I said, it's first one in favour, second one against, third one in favour, fourth one against. So it should be fairly, fairly straightforward. After they've spoken for up to three minutes, it won't be any more than that, then we will open up the debate, we'll start answering questions which people have submitted, and we'll really find out what young people think about this plan for a co uh, uh, coal mine in Copeland. So can I introduce John and ask you to, to start off the presentations, John? Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to argue in favour of the mine and I'm just going to try and talk a little bit about why we need the mine, uh, what it does for our day-to-day -day lives and, and the, necessi the necessity it, it has in, in, in the uses we have in Cumbria and also uh, in the UK and, and globally. You know, we need coal. Coal is important. It, it, um, is used in the production of steel, which we need to support our day-to-day -day lives. It plays basically three roles in the production of steel. It's a reducing agent to turn pig iron into coke. Uh, it's a source of energy to break down the, the molecular, molecular bonds um, that, that are within the materials. And it's a source of carbon for the final production. Steel is an ally of carbon and iron. Um, Nearly all steel globally is produced using uh, iron oxide and coking coal. Coking coal has special qualities that are needed in the blast furnace. And among the steel, um, or the, and the amount of steel is being produced, um, but there's currently no technologies to make steel at the scale um, using coal. We can use uh, blast furnaces, but it can only make small quantities of steel and not necessarily the amount of steel uh, we, we would require for our day-to-day -day lives. So most coal uh, or most steel is used um, producing iron ore. And you need three things uh, to make steel. It's a lot of heat, a way to uh, remove the oxygen uh, to turn the uh, iron ore uh, into iron and carbon to turn the iron into steel. Uh, alternatively, hydrogen gas can be used as a, re a reducing agent. But unfortunately, hydrogen gas is usually manufactured using fossil fuels. So it's not controlled um, in the same way um, as you will con control um, the coking coal that, that, you, that you will burn. There are alternatives such as electrolysis uh, of water, which again, uses large uh, quantities of energy. Um, there's other ways of uh, producing carbon um, in the final alloy, which people will argue that there is, but you know, a wood-based uh, process would also reduce the impacts of coal. But again, it's burning and it's taking something that's capturing our carbon uh, at the moment. Um, a recent breakthrough, breakthrough has seen tires used as an alternative to, as, as a carbon source. 
um, but it's clear there are alternatives to coal for each of the three important, uh, there, there is um, no alternative really for the, for the three important roles that uh, coal plays in steel production. In our drive to promote green energy, and um, we speak about wind uh, energy and nuclear energy, which are green energy sources. However, it has to be remembered that we need steel to assist us in producing the equipment to deliver these energy uh, propositions. Wind turbines, nuclear, SMR and AMR technologies that we're talking about as being green energies, use steel in the construction um, to allow them to produce the green energies that we require for the future. Even to produce green energy, we need to produce steel in high uh, high quality of high quality and in high quantities. So we will need coal um, extracted under controlled environmental uh, methods, which will have low or neutral impact on our environment. The proposed mine in Copeland um, is underground, is under sea, which allows greater control than surface mining uh, and methods proposed, and, and the methods proposed to be used for extraction under the present mining solution Plant in Copeland are environmentally leading technologies. Uh, by using, uh, by, by producing um, coking coal, uh, we will be helping um, the environment and the impact on the environment by reducing the carbon footprint um, by not shipping materials halfway around the world. We will also have greater controls on the impact of the, the, um, the mining that will take place, which will be under UK regulatory controls. Um, we have no control over mining that takes part in other parts of the world and are not controlled in an environmental way, environmental friendly way. And the, the modern mining technologies that will be used um, will help us to reduce the um, impact of the, um, to, to the to the environment. I argue that it's necessary um, and it is important that we carry on with this, this mine. It will bring um, wealth and it will bring control and it will bring um, the necessary products that we need for our day-to-day -day lives to be able to carry on and, and exist. So I think it, I am in favour of the mine going ahead. Thank you, John. Um, that was uh, that was a good introduction. Um, it went a little bit longer than the uh, than the three minutes, so I'd ask people to try and keep to that if they can. But I understand uh, we've got statements to make, and um, I think we can be uh, a little bit um, uh, relaxed about uh, how long people take. But over to uh, Councillor Archibald now, if you'd like to um, give us your statement, please. Yeah, thank you, Chris, and uh, welcome, uh, everybody, and uh, thank you, John, for your comments. My job, uh, when I had one before I became a councillor and a council leader, um, was in the financial sector, and, and I had to assess risks and place financial value on these risks. Climate change poses a huge risk. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge risk both to property and to human life. And while I will try to give a value to this risk in a few minutes, it could be said that it is a risk with a potentially infinite cost because it jeopardizes human existence. We, we all know now, it's pretty well agreed, that human activity is warming the planet. If we continue to pump out greenhouse, gas, greenhouse gases, uh, like carbon dioxide and, and, and methane uh, at the current rate, we will be creating enormous, enormous problems for future generations. It, it's pretty certain that unless we change our behavior and to change that behavior dramatically, millions of people will be flooded out of their homes. Fresh water will become scarce, as well as certain foods. Species will become extinct at an unprecedented rate. Weather systems will become even more extreme and violent and we'll lose large parts of our coastline. Diseases will spread, much of the coral reef will die and our lifestyles will be severely impacted. Now this coal mine is playing an ever important role in this issue of climate change. The coal mine is not essential for the steel sector. As John has indicated, we can import coking coal, 
And I say that we can import it, and I'll show later the statistics, show that we can import it at much less environmental cost than opening a mine. Indeed, this mine will add significantly to the stock of global emissions. There was an environmental report commissioned by the mine, and by those, their own calculations, the construction of the mine will emit 85,000 tons of carbon dioxide or equivalent. And by just simply operating the mine, forgetting the use of the coal, by simply operating the mine, emissions will be created of 366,000 tons of carbon dioxide and equivalent per year. These are huge amounts and they far outweigh the savings in carbon dioxide through less shipping, which are about 107,000 tons a year. And while one could maintain that the social cost of emissions is infinite, as I mentioned earlier, there are estimates and the German Environmental Agency has estimated that one ton of CO2 creates environmental damage worth 180 euro. So if we just use this figure, offset the amounts that I've mentioned for shipping and look at the, just the emissions from operations, not the use of the coal, this operations emissions, we get a damage to the environment worth just under 40 million pounds a year. We will be causing environmental damage of just under 40 million pounds a year. And this analysis ignores the likely increase in total tonnage of, of coal burnt uh, once the mine is open. So the likely financial damage is even higher. Now we must do all we can to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and we must do so immediately. Britain is chairing a very important meeting uh, in November at which over 190 countries uh, nations of the world will be assembled and it will be our job, British job, British job as chair to try and cajole them into agreeing to restrict their emissions. This is a critical meeting. It's absolutely essential that all the countries in the world do more than they're currently doing to reduce their emissions. This coal mine issue is known around the world. Greta Thunberg knows about it, John Kerry knows about it, the US administration, all the countries know about it. Our role as chair will be severely compromised if we've just given approval to a new coal mine. Now, I've spent my time as a, a council leader in trying to convince others in Cumbria that we need to show leadership in addressing climate change. If we go ahead with this mine, our ability to lead in Cumbria will be severely compromised, just as our ability in the United Kingdom and globally will be compromised. I cannot underestimate and understate, sorry, I cannot understate the importance for Britain and the world that this coal mine does not proceed. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, John. Uh, could I bring in our next speaker, uh, Trudy Harrison, MP Hobart. Thank you very much and thank you to the Centre for Leadership and Performance for arranging this evening. I thought Karenza's introduction was absolutely perfect and absolutely, you know, articulated the reasons why young people need to be involved in these discussions. My own daughters are aged between 18 and 22 and they're certainly very involved. Um, I actually agree with both speakers so far. I absolutely agree with John and the need for coking coal as part of the steel industry. Electric arc furnaces are very good for burning the scrap steel knocking around in the country, but there's only about six or seven million tonnes of that. And if we want new steel, um, at the moment, the only commercially viable way is to use coking coal. And I would also say that the emissions that are really of concern are those that come from the blast furnace, the so-called scope three emissions from the steel industry process. West Cumbria Mining have already said that they will um, cover 85% of emissions through the measures that they're taking using green diesel, using sustainable methods, uh, tree planting, solar panels and various other measures. But this is the question, is this good or bad for Cumbria? This is a much bigger question. 
This is about the recognition that coking coal is one of 27 raw materials listed by the EU as being absolutely necessary. It's about actually the ability that we have because of that mineral we have under the ground, which is particularly high quality coking coal. That's not available everywhere. Um, and I think that needs to be borne in mind as well. And it is about um, the acceptance of the steel industry um, growing 4.1% um, is anticipated to grow by next year. And the reality of how much steel we actually use, we only produce about 65% of our steel in this country, we procure the rest. Um, around about 7.3 tonnes are uh, made in the UK and about 62 million tonnes in the rest of Europe, which is why the coking coal, particularly high quality coking coal, extracted at West Cumbria Mining's Woodhouse Colliery will be used both in the UK and also in Europe as well. Um, and, and I think it's also important to recognise how much steel goes into things. So 180,000 tonnes of steel would go into one of the Rolls-Royce-led UK small modular reactors. But that's just 440 megawatts. So to achieve the 40 gigawatt aim, 40 gigawatts of nuclear power by 2050, that's just 100. So you can soon kind of scale up the need that we will have for steel. Um, four different kinds of steel, many different kind of grades, you know, tens of thousands probably of different grades. Incredibly important that we in this country have an indigenous supply, I believe, of steel. And if we agree to that, then I also think it's important that we have a supply of coking coal. In 2019, we imported 2.177 million tonnes of coking coal from places as far as Australia, Russia, the United States, and that was transported on fossil fuel ships and trains, which covered huge areas of land before arriving into the UK. Clearly, there's an economic uh, benefit to Cumbria in doing this, and indeed to the country, with 500 jobs, 2,000 indirect jobs, £1.8 billion contribution to GDP in the first 10 years. There is an economic benefit, but I think more than that, there's an environmental benefit, because the Prime Minister's 10-point plan, just about every single aspect of that needs steel. And I believe we should have a strong, sustainable and successful steel industry here in the UK to support what will be a growing need for an absolutely vital commodity in the future. The second most used material in the world. Um, I think it's about 1.8 billion tonnes are um, made across the world um, every year. So that will only continue particularly as we transition from fossil fuels into low carbon alternatives. Um, and this is about context. Um, it's, it would be easy to say we shouldn't have vehicles on the road because they're responsible for 1800 deaths. It would be easy to say we shouldn't have wind turbines because they're responsible for killing tens of thousands of birds, but this is the reality of a commodity that's needed for the transition of a vital part of creating that material. And as I say, electric arc furnaces will play their part. And I also think hydrogen will play a significant part. The Prime Minister is committed to five gigawatts by 2030, but the reality of that is you know about uh, a gigawatt will provide for a million homes. There's 23 million homes on the national gas network. So we probably need more like 115 gigawatts just for the national gas network. That's not to say that that's what we're doing, but it gives you some idea of context of how much hydrogen and other um, biogases will be needing in the future. Massive need for steel. Indigenous steel is what I want to see. We have the commodity in West Cumbria. We've got private investment, not government investment. And by and large, it's got overwhelming support from my constituents. Thank you, Trudy. That was uh, a very good, balanced argument. You made a lot of points there, which I'm sure people will be picking up on. Um, if we can go on to our next speaker, which is Maggie Mason. Uh, I would ask you to, um, everyone's going over a little bit, Maggie, so uh, I would expect you would do the same. 
But what I'm going to do is just put a put a hand up in my window when you've reached the three minute mark. So if you could think about sort of starting to wrap it up at that point, that would be excellent. So over to you, Maggie. Hello. Just had to change my microphone. Hopefully I'm right. right. Yes, you said you might. So sorry about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm, um, I'm hoping that people have read the blurb that I put in for the website, because to be honest, I'm going to try and answer the questions you've put forward and also deal with some of the issues that other people have already said. So I was a town planner uh, working in the minerals and waste team at the County Council for 10 years to 2015. I understand planning policy, I understand how to read documents, and I have delved into and read all the West Cumbria mining uh, documents and the County Council doc documents, and I'm going to try and answer things that I really know about from a professional point of view, um, and I've also been talking to uh, expert witnesses about that we are working with already for the public inquiry that's coming up. Number one, um, the need for coking coal for making steel is a thing of the past. The future, the current point now, but the past. Because 30 years ago or more, the government made a good plan to get rid of using coke in co uh, ordinary thermal coal in power generation. They've taken 30 years to do that and they've got to that point. But they also have a plan for making, coke, making steel without carbon by 2035. That has got to be largely without coking coal. It will be done, they have said, through using hydrogen, which is far more advanced than I'm afraid John knows, um, and is moving even faster in Europe than it is here. So we don't believe that this coking coal is going to be needed um, beyond 2030, 2035. And the government, uh, the county council has now, is now no longer pushing the argument that they put forward in their uh, report because of the sixth carbon budget, um, the UK carbon budget has now clearly said, we've got to be making steel without any carbon emissions by 2035. This can happen, it needs to happen. And therefore this coking coal, I'm afraid will have um, a short life. I also need to say that the, although some qualities of the coal from West Cumbria mining are very good, it has a real problem with its sulfur content. And they have never said that they would sell more than 360,000 tonnes of this two and a half million, nearly three million tonnes of coal in the UK. They have always said that they would um, sell most of it in Europe. Um, but Europe, of course, is also moving away from, um, uh, from using coking coal very fast. And they have the same issues with sulphur content in coal because it causes acid rain. So we're not sure whether there is really a market for this anyway, the quality is that there is. So we, we believe that this is not going to go forward. And I think there are far, far better ways of young people to get jobs and skills. There is no way that we can make sure that any jobs from this mine go to local people. It can't be done. It's not legal to stop it. And, the count that, and most of the jobs are for deep coal miners. The well paid ones are for people who work in a deep coal mine. So I really believe that the green economy needs to move forward here and young people need to invest their own efforts in getting skills that will be need, needed in an economy of the future. I think I'm probably up with my three minutes, am I? You are up with your three minutes. If you just want to do a wrap up statement there and then we'll move on. Yes. So I, I, there will also be a number of impacts from this mine and uh, there will be impacts on the tourist industry because it's going to interfere with footpaths. There will be noise, there will be dust, particularly in the Powerbeck Valley, and they will be really noticeable in those sort of areas. And I'm also very worried about water pollution from what's going to happen, um, what has to happen, breaking down in the end of a landfill. The details of contamination are very worrying. So I really think that for young people, the best future is one without this mine. Thank you, Maggie. Um, can I now move on to Mike Starkey, uh, elected mayor of Copeland, if he'll give us his statement. And as I say, the same as with Maggie, what I will do when you reach the three, three minute Mike, uh, mark, Mike, I will stick a hand up in my window and let you know that it's time to start wrapping it up. But over to you. 
Thanks, Christopher, and I'll keep within the three minutes because I'll uh, I'll pick a lot of the points up in the in the Q and A's. You know, I first want to start off by uh, agreeing with uh, Councillor Giles Archibald. Uh, later this year, there is an extremely important conference, the COP conference, being held in the UK, and at that conference, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom can climb up on the stage and quite proudly say that the United Kingdom are reducing emissions faster than any other leading economy on the planet. And it could possibly set an objective for the conference where to every other country, he makes a statement that if they can get in the next five years to where we already are today, then the world from an environmental point of view will be a much better place. Um, Maggie's, uh, Maggie's comment that, the, that there's, there's no market for this well, you know, private investors don't tend to spend their own money where they don't think they're going to get a return. And private investment is putting millions and millions of pounds into this, expecting a significant return. Um, you know, that simply doesn't happen. These are people putting the money where their mouth is and they're backing their own judgment. When we look at uh, environmental e emissions around, you know, Maggie also talked about 2035. That's, you know, a shot in the dark and it's still 14 years away. Um, and, you know, Trudy spoke about, you know, taking cars off the road to, to get rid of road deaths. You know, there's got to be a balanced approach to everything we do. You know, in Cumbria, the Lake District gets 18 million tourists a year. The level of pollution and environmental damage that causes is massive. You know, they all come in the diesel cars and diesel camper vans and petrol cars, but I don't see anybody standing on the border of Kendall saying you're not coming here unless you're coming in an electric vehicle. Uh, and electric vehicles are here today. They're there and available now, but there's got to be a transition period and there's got to be a transition period for coal. Giles also mentioned John Kerry. You know, now, now, you know the... The anti-miners going to John Kerry uh, and quoting him is, is just how desperate, desperately sad this uh, anti-mine campaign is. You know, John Kerry didn't, even in his quote, speak specifically about metallurgical coal. He was talking more about thermal coal. But really, John Kerry advising the United Kingdom on reducing emissions from coal, you know, it's like me taking... Uh, health advice from a chain smoker as a non-smoker. You know, I think he's got more than enough to do and enough to deal with in reducing the emissions in the United States. You know, in the UK, you know, we've already reduced um, our need for thermal coal massively. You know, the, the, the rest of the world's aiming to reduce that to zero by 2030 and the United Kingdom will do that by 2024. So, it's, you know, John uh, Coughlin at the start of the day, you know, he, he mentioned that you need steel. You know, we're coming out of COVID and this country's got to build back better. And that requires huge amounts of infrastructure. You know, the green agenda to really drive forward climate change is we, we need more wind farms. We, may, we need more tidal barriers. We need more solar energy and, and something I have a particular interest, we need loads more nuclear energy and all of those take significant amount of steel, which drives demand for coking coal now all the way to 2035 and beyond because the, the technology does not exist. It's mythical. You know, I've heard on these radio debates, you know, that we should be investing in green jobs. Well, the, the, the green jobs the real green jobs that people will invest in, you know, will come through wind, wave, solar and nuclear. And for all of those, we need steel. And I think we've also got to bear in mind that- you Can know, I ask you to just quickly wrap up? Yes, I will do. The, you know, as a wrap up statement, I'll say this project represents a major new investment for Copeland and for West Cumbria, and it will create hundreds of newly skilled jobs in a coastal community. It also represents a new large export industry for the UK and Copeland and Cumbria will come a, a key part of the international steel industry and it will bring 600 jobs locally to the directly to the mine and thousands more in the supply chain. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Mike. 
Right, finally, on to Rebecca Willis, Professor in Practice at Lancaster Environment Centre. Uh, Rebecca, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chris, and, and, and thanks uh, for organising the debate today and to all of you who've come along. Um, I'm a professor at Lancaster University and I've worked with governments on climate issues for the past 20 years. And my motivation for my work is this. I want to do all I can to avert the climate crisis that threatens our futures. And I don't have any other reason for speaking out on this mine. So um, I'm going to make four points. First, West Cumbria needs good jobs. Second, no new coal mines can be built if we're going to avert the climate crisis. Thirdly, there is no evidence that the mine has environmental benefits or that steelmakers need it. And fourth, that government has let West Cumbria down by supporting this mine. And I'll go through each of those in turn, but at each stage, what I would say is, you can argue either way, but where is the evidence for this? And it's my job as an academic to assess the evidence. And I have to say that West Cumbria Mining have been playing fast and loose, loose with their arguments. There's very little evidence to support the claim, no evidence to support the claims they're making. And I looked at this in detail and I published something in The Guardian today, which I'll give you a link to, which really gets into the detail of how this, um, this, this false evidence came to the fore. So on jobs, firstly, I absolutely understand the need for good jobs in West Cumbria. There aren't enough opportunities, like in other post-industrial communities, especially for young people. It's the government's responsibility to encourage those jobs and they haven't done well at this. Okay, second, on climate. The climate crisis is urgent and the science is clear. No new coal mines can be built if we're to meet our climate targets. That's, that's the situation. That's not me talking. That's the world's leading scientists, the International Energy Agency and the United Nations Environment Programme. Thirdly, there is no evidence that this mine has climate benefits or environmental benefits. The only way that you can make this argument is if you forget about the carbon emissions caused by burning that coal. That is 9 million tonnes of emissions every year, more than double the whole of Cumbria. There's more than enough coal in existing mines for steel companies to use while they move away from coal. And all UK and European steel companies have plans to make steel without coal, backed by the government. And in fact, at the, in Parliament yesterday, the Minister Kwasi Kwarteng was in agreement with steel companies that by the mid 2030s, this would happen. I can show you the evidence on that again. So many, including West Cumbria Mining, the County Council and local politicians have said that there will be climate benefits to this mine and that the steel industry needs it. And both claims are wrong. And as an academic, my job is to find the evidence. I've done that and I can show you that there's no evidence to back either of those claims. I can show you my working. So where does this leave us? Of course, this leaves West Cumbria in a difficult position and I find that really tough. I think this community has been failed by the County Council and national government and the politicians who support the mine. And that's not an easy thing to say, but I think we need to face up to that. And what they should have done is to encourage jobs in the industries we'll need for the future, like renewable energy and low carbon buildings and the low carbon steel that we need um, to make that renewable energy and those buildings. And other parts of the country, like the Humber over on the East Coast, have done this. Hum the Humber is now a hub for wind energy with thousands of jobs and that could happen here. And I do know that vague promises of green jobs are not good enough. And my work every day focuses on how we can move away from those vague promises and transform and strengthen our economy while dealing with climate change. But this mine is a terrible distraction from that crucial ambition. And frankly, it doesn't deserve your support. Right, thank you very much indeed. Um, I think we've got some fascinating and very different views expressed by our speakers. Um, I'd like now to open the, the floor to um, some of the questions that we've got. Um, thank you. I've just noticed that in the, in the chat, um, Rebecca has put in a, a link to her article in The Guardian, so that's really useful. Um, so we can, uh, I'm sure we'll all be looking at that afterwards. Um, but first, can I ask um, if Amy is on the call? I, I think she is. 
And um, would she like to ask a question now? I think she, she was in our queue to ask a question. Hi, Amy. Hello, thank you very much. Um, I would just like to ask um, the pro-mine um, debate, why you think that you can undermine the incredible work that goes on every day by scientists, by activists, by campaigners, um, of which we have so many in Cumbria um, who every day are fighting for a better world in which we reduce our carbon emissions and in which people like myself, young people, your children have a future. Um, I know so many people in our local Cum Cumbrian communities who are fighting so hard, whether it's people who are planting trees, restoring peat bogs, whether it's scientists who are, are researching how we can reduce emissions in the future, or whether it's people who are trying to educate school children or doing everything they can in their everyday lives, not flying abroad on holiday, reducing their single use plastic, eating plant-based food. And I feel like Cumbria is this epicenter of sustainability and we can be an example to the rest of the world what happens when a local community comes together to be an example of how we can live sustainably in the future. And this one mine is going to undermine all of that and it is going to be a global disgrace and instead put Cumbria on the map um, for completely undermining our government's targets to reach a, a net zero world. Um, so I wonder how you feel that um, you can justify this with creating the mine when we can create green jobs and when we need to decarbonise our economy. Thank you, Amy. Very good question. Could I ask our pro mine panel, would someone like to volunteer to respond to Amy's question? How can you yeah. justify supporting the mine? Uh, I think we've, got, like, we've got Trudy also uh, sort of queuing to do this. Um, John, do you want to do this as well? Can I start with Trudy, ladies first, and then I'll go to Mike and John. Trudy, over to you. Thank you, and thank you very much for the question, Amy. It, it is actually about the context that we imported over two million tonnes of coking coal. And to Rebecca's point, I'd be interested to know the um, specific volatility and type and whether it was metallurgical coal that you were referencing because importing coal that then needs to go through a process as part of the blast furnace is very, very different to having um, the, the kind of coal um, that would be needed without that process. Also on the, sulf the uh, sulfur content, I spoke to West Cumbria Mine about this and they um, believe through geo-environmental investigations that it would be an average of 1.1, not the 1.4 that the planning um, document does state at the higher level. I know there is that uh, conflicting information about the sulfur content, but really to speak to your point, Amy, it's because all of those green jobs need steel. And I just don't think it's right to be importing the cooking coal. But also, I think we've managed to turn this organic matter, because uh, we're not banning mining. We hope to have lithium mines in this country. We'll still continue to mine for slate in the Lake District. So mining will still continue. Um, but I, I suppose it's the reality that this is needed for new steels and we can extract it in a way that maintains higher environmental standards, better worker standards, providing a benefit for Cumbria economically, and also making sure that we can control and transition from uh, fossil fuels to low carbon alternatives. But why is nobody talking about the emissions that are coming out of blast furnaces? because that's the real problem. I think you should be lobbying for carbon capture on refineries and blast furnaces. We are investing in the research and development to do that, but I would like to do a lot more because that would make a huge difference. And also up in the um, amount of hydrogen that uh, we've committed to, five gigawatts by 2030 is nowhere near enough. And there's a great opportunity for co-generation between nuclear and hydrogen, which is also what I'm advocating for. Every day of my working life,
life. I'm trying to bring more nuclear to West Cumbria. Those are the kind of green jobs, highly paid, highly skilled. We have a track record over 70 years of doing this very well. And as we um, decommission as well, the work that we've done in using robotics and artificial intelligence is now being exported across the globe. And that's also perhaps not a green industry, but they're clean jobs for the generations uh, to come. Thank you, Trudy. Could I, could I ask that I just use one speaker for this because we've got a lot of questions piling up in our uh, in our chat box. Just while I've got you, Trudy, we've had this question from a couple of people. You mentioned green diesel at the yeah. West Cumbria mine. What do you mean by green diesel? Essentially with uh, less harmful gases than conventional diesel. But we can also look at hydrogen. We can look at biofuels. There are a range of different gases that can be used in all you know, machinery that currently uses conventional diesel or even petrol at the moment. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got Clark on the line. Could I ask Clark if you'd like to ask your question? Um, yes, thank you. Um, just on the point about uh, the sulfur involved in the mine, um, sort of a hypothetical question, because uh, I note that um, the uh, planning officer sent an email to British Steel asking them for their opinion on the sort of content in the mine and whether or not they would be able to use this coal uh, given its sulfur content. And they were, I would say, equivocal. They, they, they said they weren't sure. So hypothetically, if it were the case that most European and British um, Coal, uh, steel production wasn't able to use the coal because it were it, it had too high sulfur, sulfur content. Would uh, the pro mine panelists still think it would be acceptable for that coal to instead be sold to uh, countries further away, say in Asia? Would they consider, given the fact that would ha that would kind of that would negate the transport benefit, the, the cutting of the transport benefits um, in relation to the coal, and therefore wouldn't have the benefit we're hoping for? Would they still? Um, consider that to be a good thing for Cumbria or would the and, for, and regards to climate change or would they consider that not to be? Yeah. Can, can I briefly answer this and then I promise I won't ask, answer any more. Um, just because I actually spoke to uh, the CEO of that um, particular company over in um, Scunthorpe and the answer that they gave to the planning officer was that they could handle sulphur up to 1.4 and that then became the figure in the planning document. That's how this came about. Um, and that is from the CEO and also from West Cumbria mining themselves. Okay. But the average we expect to be 1.1. Right. Do I support, support that? Because I'm a sister company to Bridley Steel and, and I can uh, confirm that um, Trudy is correct in what she said. Okay, thank you very much, John. Thank you very much, Trudy. Um, I think we've got... Um, can I, can I just quickly correct? Can I just quickly say something, Chris? Yes, the, of course. The, the, the questioner uh, said that there would be shipping savings. I just want to be clear: those shipping savings are dwarfed by the carbon emissions by just operating the mine. I want to be absolutely clear about that. And th those are in the, uh, the environmental reports commissioned by the mine itself. So when you talk about savings from shippings, there are there are no net savings from shippings. It, when you take account of just the operation of the mine. Can I also I think we need to come back in on that? I'm in with a point of correction because um, I have read very carefully West Cumbria Mining's case put forward by their lawyers to the public inquiry. Nowhere in there do they make any claims about what their sulphur is to be. They've avoided it altogether. Um, nowhere have they said where they are going to sell the coal to, other than possibly Baltic countries, and um, they specifically say Baltic countries um, and, and the North Sea countries and some in the UK. Um, the, 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 and neither is there any suggestion that they are going to offset 85% of the scope three emissions from this mine. That is not in their submission. They have no evidence to support that. I think it's very, very important that young people are able to go back and read. It's a very simple document, really, that the West Cumbria's lawyers have put forward, claiming what they are claiming. And it is, doesn't fit with the things that I'm afraid the proponents of the mine are putting forward. They okay. are avoiding the issues of, of sulphur altogether. I've got, I've got a hand up from Emmy. 
So, Emmy, would you like to contribute to this? And then I'll go back to Trudy to rebut, and then we'll move on to another subject, please. Yeah. Hi. Um, so one thing that I'm slightly confused about is, so the UK produces coal, but is this part of the existing supply chain that um, in the steel supply chain, or is it all just coming from internationally? So if it is coming from international, why aren't we already using the existing domestic production of coal? So in other words, is that, does the UK currently have a supply, an indigenous yes, supply of coking coal? And we so, we supply, no, that's what we supply, um, we produce 2.2 million tonnes in 2019. Is this part of the supply chain or are you only sourcing from internationally at present? And if so, why? There's, there's a slight difference between what you would um, look upon as domestic coal or coal that you would burn to produce heat. Um, this is a, a coal, it's referred to as coking coal because it's got high elements of carbon. Um, and remember, um, I pointed out in, in, in my talk earlier on that we need carbon. And, and somebody said earlier on, we didn't need carbon to produce steel. Well, you do because remember that steel is an ally, as I pointed out, of carbon and iron. So you must have carbon to produce steel. You cannot produce steel without carbon. And that's why it's called carbon steel. But to go back to your question is, we import all of the coking coal um, that we consume in this country. We don't produce it. And the coal that, that's mostly produced in this country is used um, on domestic or um, energy um, production. Okay, thank you. Uh, I've got a question from Alicia. Alicia Windle, would you like to uh, step up and ask a question, Alicia? Hi, um, uh, this sort of is open to anyone. Um, I was just wondering what sort of long-term impact we're like, looking to see from this sort of environmentally. Like if by some chance it was able to shut down because they don't need it anymore, what will happen to that area? Will it be like able to be used for other things like will you just fill up the mine with, I don't know, dirt or something? What's going to happen to that if it ever does shut down? The plan, the plan with the mine at the end of life is to return it to its original state. Uh, what was that? Of greenfield sites. Right, so it could be used for like, I don't know, agricultural purposes or building houses on. I'm sorry, I have to correct that. But the mine head, what one might call the pit head, is um, is currently a decontaminated site from previous industry. Um, the other part of the mine that the, the needs to be is the, 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 the rail loading facility, which is in a greenfield site, but that's relatively small. Um, so restoration of the mine um, involves, you know, taking away the, the most, the, you have to remember, this isn't a hole in the ground in the sense, because it, it's deep on the, the holes, the voids are deep under the ground. So, I mean, there will be restoration plans um, on the, the main mine site, but that is, um, that is obviously a long way into the future. Um, so and so the, aim, the aim would be, from, from the documents I've read and from what Mike says, and, and Maggie, you, you agree with this, that the aim would be to restore it um, to, so it's not an eyesore, the aim would be to actually remediate that land to make it suitable for other uses. Is that what you well, were wondering about? Can I, can I come in here? Area to use altogether. It's not going to get remediated so it can be used for, for very much, but um, make it not an eyesore. If that, if that happens, it's a long way Chris, to the future. Can I come in and answer an aspect of Alicia's question? Because Alicia, you asked what would happen if the coal wasn't needed anymore. And, um, you know, that hasn't been thought through. So I was interested that Mike said, um, we know that the coal's needed because, um, you know, a lot of private money has gone into this. Well, that's not true because the money that's going in is venture capital money. And the way that venture capital works is that they essentially bet money on projects, some of which come off and some of which don't. So they're betting on us having weak enough climate legislation that we allow this mine to go ahead and they can sell coal for as long as they can, contributing to dangerous climate change. And they're betting um, that they will make a profit 
out of um, you know essentially the the, the 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 fag end of the carbon economy, and that's not moral. Um, they also haven't thought about what would happen to those jobs or those communities if the mine uh, wasn't to go ahead or if it was to go ahead and had to close um, because steel makers had moved on from coal. So they're not serving the interests of the local community by putting this investment forward. And I mean, while I've got the floor, I would just like to say that we've heard a lot of things from other speakers which are not backed up by evidence, like Trudy, your comment that 85% of scope three, that's end use emissions from coal being burned, will be uh, will be sequestered, will be stored. That's not true. West Cumbria Mining haven't said that. Um, equally, um, uh, John's point that, um, you know, and, and Mike said there's no way of making coal and uh, making steel without coal. Again, that's not true. And that's very different from what the steel industry themselves propose. So Can if I, I made those yeah, sorts of claims in my job, if I made those sorts of claims in my job, which were not backed up by evidence, I, you know, I would be outed for them. And I think that evidence point is really, really important. So I would ask, what's your evidence for those points? Can I just rebut on that one, Christopher? You, you, you know, we talk a lot about evidence and there's a, a democratic process that you go through to, uh, to get these decisions. Um, this has been before a planning panel on three occasions where all experts, on all sides of the argument, had every opportunity to make the case and argue the case. And an independent panel uh, from across the cross section of the community listened to the evidence of experts on both sides. And you know, bear, bear in mind, you know, particularly with environmental issues, you know, the experts don't all agree. They all have different viewpoints. You know, Rebecca hasn't got uh, exclusive rights to uh, correct evidence. Um, so when it was presented to a cross section of the community on three separate occasions, this mine was unanimously approved. Can I wrap up that question there, please? Uh, could I, just, could, I, could, I, could, I, could go. I just point out something that's important? I did say that there was alternative methods of producing coal or producing steel other than using coking coal, but I also pointed out that many of those um, systems required other means of fossil fuels to be inputted. Uh, and I, I also pointed it out um, that using, uh, you could use um, tires. And I said that there was impacts on the environment from many uh, of the other inputs, such as tires, et cetera, that you could use to produce the carbon. So it's yeah, not true you. to say that those things were not pointed out. They thank were you. pointed out, but were, we... we were told that they were also had major adverse impacts on the environment. Okay, can we leave that one behind and move on because we've got some other questions here. We'll go back to them at the end if we have time. Robin Spur, you've got a question for us. You've been asking that for a while. So would you like to step up and ask that question? Brilliant, yeah, thank you. Um, I think we've heard like a rather a lot of figures around carbon and carbon equivalents. And I know these sort of things are hard, but I wondered if we had a more definitive answer in terms of whether life cycle assessments have been done on the mine and its processes versus shipping coal processed overseas. Because if coal plants like, overseas are still like, producing scope three emissions, there, there still are emissions. So I just wondered if they put, put forward a um, a side-by-side -side assessment. Okay, can I ask first if there is one of the pro people who can answer that just in a minute, please, and then I'll let someone rebut from the anti-mine. So is there someone from the pro side who could, who could take that on? So in other words, has there been a valid comparison between importing the coal and digging it up ourselves and using it ourselves? I am very happy to have a go. I'm not aware of a actual comparison other than um, the obvious factor of shipping and transporting coking coal and also the working practices that we would be using in this country. But I think you mentioned scope three emissions and just to be clear, the first kind of emissions are the extraction process. The next is the cleansing and transportation to the to the blast furnace and then the third scope is at the blast furnace 
I never said that scope three emissions would be covered off at 85%. It is the extraction process that I was talking about. We are way off, way, way, way off being in a position of being able to um, tackle the emissions at the blast furnace. And that's where the effort really needs to be because that's where the real problem is, which is why I'm so keen on carbon capture and using the existing network in the North Sea and off Merseyside to use that uh, technology which the government is investing in. Okay, thank you, Trudy. Um, someone from the anti-mine side, just to uh, speak on that one? I mean, Giles or, or Rebecca, which, which one would like to do it? We have expert evidence from Professor Paul Eakins, who is a resource economist, one of the country's leading resource economists, I'll put it in the chat. Uh, which said that this mine will be responsible for additional carbon emissions. That is because if you open a mine, the coal will be burned. So you can argue and you can you can argue it either way on the emissions from the mine itself and from shipping. Um, but those emissions are tiny in comparison to the emissions from burning the coal. The only way that it would work is if is if um, the only way that if if the, um, if another mine elsewhere in the world were to close down as a result of this mine opening, um, which is what the mining company claims would happen, um, then that would be different. But that is not how the market works. And I'll, I'll put a link in the chat to this expert evidence from Paul Eakins about that. Okay, thank you, Rebecca. Can I move on to Erin Pennington? Erin, you had a question for us. Hi, um, I think this is probably more of a question for the pro mining panelists but on the against side Maggie mentioned something about her having some kind of concerns about pollution issues and it's kind of building off from that we know that kind of exposure to coal ash can result in some kind of medical issues a lot of kind of lung maybe lung cancer and asthma and could actually kill you is there some kind of plan in place to help miners who are going to be underground doing this mining and is anyone on the pro side kind of concerned about the potential health issues and what that could do to, on a more personal note, families rather than the economy as a whole. Thank you, Erin. Right. Uh, what about the health and safety for the miners who are going to be working in this facility? Who would like to respond to that one? Yeah, Trudy again. I'm happy to. I mean, I, I probably um, could depend on John for more uh, accurate advice as he is in the industry. But uh, the, the point here is that this mine would be the cleanest, greenest mine um, to be constructed so far. And as Mike Starkey, Copeland's mayor, explained, the planning process means that a huge amount of work is done with the Environment Agency and other what they call statutory consultees to actually understand how this would impact on people working in the mine. My granddad was a miner, but it was very, very different in those days. Um, machinery would be used a lot more than it was in the olden days. But compared to the rest of the world, our standards are far better. And that is another reason why I'm supportive of this mine, because if we all agree we need steel, we'll probably, if this doesn't happen, continue to import the coking coal, but we'll also continue to buy our steel from places like China or other parts of the world where the, uh, the standards that people are working in aren't as good as ours in the UK. I think we can be very, very proud of the standards that we have and the way in which we protect our workforce um, in, in various industries, in every industry in the United Kingdom, and that will continue. I think to add on the health issues as well, you know, the, the, the miners who go into this mine are more likely to have a console than a pickaxe. You know, they'll be sat at a control desk um, operating machinery underground. Um, you know, they're not going to be crawling around on the hands and knees uh, as, as they were in, uh, as, as we've seen historically with coal mines. Okay, does anyone from the, from the anti-mine side want to talk about the health issues before we move on? Well, my points are not about the health issues of the workers, because that's not something I have a great deal of information about and what Trudy and, and John say uh, um, is most probably true. Um, I'm more concerned about two kinds of things. One is the coal dust from the um, loading facility and the impact, the impact on that, because I think there will be impacts on 
people who live locally. Coal Action Network has done a, um, put a lot of evidence in about um, mines in the northeast. And although they are open cast, and this is deep, once you start trundling the coal down a conveyor belt and tipping it pretty well continuously all day into trains that are loading there, um, there will be coal dust impacts. And although the, as a planner, we used to have limits that we would impose, those limits are more related to what you get in the air quality in a city and in really bad places. So both noise and, and air quality will be significantly reduced roundabout. But I'm particularly concerned about the fact that we still don't have a plan for how West Cumbria mining is intending to get the sulphur content lower um, and what the adverse impacts of that have been because they've had to make several changes during the development of this, of this uh, plan um, because they've hit up against environmental issues from the Environment Agency and they've had to change what they've done. And that's one of the main reasons why there's been such a big delay because West Cumbria Mining had to change, keep changing what they were doing. Now, at the moment, they're trying to say that although they previously were going to um, sell the worst polluting and the highest sulfur coal separately, they were then told they couldn't do that. So now they're trying to say they're going to mix it all in and turn it into this lower carbon, um, lower sulfur content of coal that, um, that, that, uh, that uh, Trudy has spoken about. Now, they have not submitted any information about how they were going to do that. What they've got to do is what crush and wash a lot of the sulfur off the coal. And that I has been getting some way away from the original question. Well, on this. it's about the pollution because Minus. there's significant water. I'll, I'll wind it into this then because it produces mine, um, sulfuric acid or it explodes if the, if the dust is too fine. None of those issues have been looked at. And you've also already got a site where the aquifers, the water supply of local people is being affected by the past contamination from the site and it's all got to be opened up it's got to be done incredibly well not to make the contamination worse and the new processors on the site have not yet been examined in the environmental impact assessment okay so i'm can worried I, about can i just stop it there because i think we we covered that off erin did that answer your questions uh yes thank you thank you um, I think we had Emmy with a hand up and Carenza with a hand up. Carenza's got hers up at the moment. So would you like to ask your question? Then I'll go to Emmy. Hi, yeah. Um, my question was purely for um, just about the structure of the mine. As I heard earlier that it was going to be stretching underneath the sea. Um, and it was purely about the safety of that due to quite a few of the mines already that were set up in Whitehaven collapsing underneath the ocean. Um, I make reference there to the William Pitt disaster of 1947. I know it was a lot different back then, but I just wondered about the structure of the mine and how it was going to um, be set up then. It's just, it's very personal to me because my great grandfather died during that Pitt disaster. So I just want to make sure that nothing like that happens again. Okay, that's obviously uh, a valid question. Could I ask Mike, because this is this is your uh, local patch, if you like, um, what do you think about this mining under the sea? And do you think that presents an unreasonable risk? No, I don't. It, uh, you know, I think it's truly alluded to earlier. This is probably not probably this is going to be the most modern um, coal mine ever constructed anywhere in the world. And there's obviously it's gone through an extremely rigorous planning process. You know, the planning process is has rumbled on now for for almost four years. You know, Maggie spoke earlier that she uh, was a planning officer um, at Cumbria County Council, um, was a planning officer. It's worth sort of pointing out the ones who are currently planning officers recommended the approval of this man. Um, you know, we've got all the up-to-date information and are working under current planning regulations uh, and are working uh, in the current situation as it stands now. So, you know, this mine has gone through the most rigorous planning process um, of any project that I'm aware of uh, in, in Cumbria, probably. Um, and on every single occasion when the evidence has been presented by experts from all sides, um, an independent cross-section of the community have unanimously approved that this mine should go ahead. Okay, thank you, Mike. Emmy, would can you like to ask that question? Can I just come in on that, Chris? Yes. Um, because Mike, Mike, and I quite understand Mike's point, and it's a valid point, but in presenting the case, 
the officers to, to the to council said that this mine will contribute positively to climate change. And Becky and Maggie, I'm sure, will back me up on this. They, 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 they made a presentation saying that it could have a positive impact on climate change. That was incorrect. I don't know why they stated that. Uh, I think it's probably because they weren't fully aware of all the implications, but they stated it and it was erroneous. And it was shown to be erroneous by the Climate Change Committee, which is a committee of experts commissioned by the government to advise them on climate change issues. And, a, and then there was a letter written by that committee to uh, the Secretary of State in January saying, this mine will add to the uh, net uh, emissions globally and will have a deleterious effect on climate change. And I believe, Mike, and it, it, I mean, it's a matter for discussion, obviously, but I believe that the committee was misled by the officers and took their decisions on basis of information that has been shown to be incorrect. And this, this invalidates, I think, I'm afraid, your comment that this was a reasoned uh, consideration by the committee. Okay, can I... Can I you're suggesting they were misled at the first planning meeting when it was unanimously approved, or the second planning meeting when it was unanimously approved, or the third planning meeting, or are you suggesting they were misled at all three? I think you've made the point there, Mike. Giles, I think you've made your point as well. Can I move on to Emmy, who's been waiting and being very patient? So, Emmy, would you like to pose your question? I mean, I was going to delve deeper into the issue about the health of miners because operating heavy machinery is is still dental to their um, health and working underground. However, um, I think it's also important to pose the question, so why why is there the need for this public inquiry? Why, what wasn't good enough about the County Council's first approval in the first place? What's changed? That's a very good question. Who can, I answer that one as a planner? can I answer that one as a planner? Okay, can you make it reasonably short, Maggie, please? Thank you. Okay, so after they made their decision, a new piece of evidence came out, which was the UK's sixth carbon budget. And they hadn't been able to consider that. And therefore, um, a number of us pointed that out to both the um, Secretary of State and so on. Now, that, that, that is one of the reasons why the Cumbria County Council isn't defending its decision anymore. It is neutral on the next stage, because whereas their reports had said to them, there will be a need for this coal till 2049 unless something changes, they realised that sixth carbon budget had changed something and therefore it needed to be looked at again. Okay. I'll come back in, the sixth carbon budget is just advisory. Um, and it, you know it's gone to a planning inquiry because that's the process it follows because the leadership of Cumbria County Council decided to call back in to the planning panel which had already approved it three terms. Unfortunately the leader of the Cumbria County, County Council is anti-mine and you know as it goes to the public inquiry the, the County Council have took a neutral position which is quite a remarkable thing to do when the democratic decision of the council was to approve the mine, but only three three councillors, none of whom are on the planning committee, have, have been involved in the decision to take a neutral stance for the county council. The normal position would be to revert to support the last decision uh, that the democratically elected members had made. I think we're getting into procedure there. Does that answer your question, Emmy, or does it show, shed some light on it? Yeah, I think it shed some light, thank you. Thank you. Um, Trudy, did you wish to make a point there? Yeah, it was just to, to make a point that in the letter from Robert Jenrick, the Secretary of State for the Ministry of Homes uh, and Communities and Local Government, he also stated that non-determination, the fact that Cumbria County Council hadn't been able to um, move on after the planning committee had made their decision, as you've heard three times, um, they failed to provide the permits to West Cumbria Mining. And so the Secretary of State also in his letter said that part of the reason for asking somebody independent, which is the planning inspectorate, not political, because Cumbria County Council is obviously, it's political, it's, it's led by Labour with Lib Dem support, 
and um, to take the politics out of it, hand it to somebody independent and that planning inquiry starts on the 7th of September and it's going to run for 16 days. So it's taken the politics out of it as well, essentially. OK, thank you. Um, Alicia had another question. Do you want to ask that question, Alicia? And then we'll move on to Carenza. I was just wondering, how can we, you know, be sure that Cumbria will actually benefit itself if you can't guarantee that the jobs like constructing and running the mine will go to locals, which is probably unlikely considering the high skilled nature that it will be once it's operational and I find it unlikely that they will be willing to train up local people rather than getting contractors. Could I answer that? Um, yep. As, a, as, a, as an employer, you know, and, and I've moved to Cumbria from um, outside Cumbria and I've lived in many parts of the world. I can tell you some of the smartest people um, and you do yourself down live in Cumbria. If you look at, there's two things you need to look at in Cumbria. The level of educators that we have in the region in Cumbria are the highest anywhere I've come across, not only in the UK or the British Isles, but in the world. You look at the number of awards that go to skilled individuals and individual workers in Cumbria um, across national um, awards like the Manufacturing 100, the Manufacturing Champions, high proportion of those awards go to a small region in the UK called Cumbria. So we have people who are capable of taking on the highest skill um, jobs in, in, in this country or internationally. So there is no reason that the people in this region could not um, take on the skill jobs or be trained to, to take on those skill jobs. And from an employer's investment perspective in terms of in investing in, in those skills in the future, you get such a, a, a fantastic return in this region. I think I there's no reason that, that people that. would not get those jobs. I don't, I'm not trying to say that we don't have people that aren't educated on this, but from a perspective and what I've learned in my business studies, it's unlikely for how long they're planning to have this operational, I can't see the benefit in them training these people up when they can't guarantee that it's going to be operational for that amount, like, amount of time. And how can you be sure that it will be beneficial to Cumbria in the end? Well, you're still talking many years. They're looking at 30, 30 year lifespan at least for that man, which is, you know, I don't know too many people who've seen any of the same employment for that period of time in the modern age. But this is 160 million pounds a private investment into the West Cumbrian economy. And it's not just the direct jobs at the mine, it's the, it's the supply chain jobs it creates, it's the input into local hospitality, into local retailers. Um, it, it brings a huge investment into the area and creates diversification in the economy and choice um, of employment opportunities going forward. Okay. Is, has that answered your question, Alicia? Because I notice Corinda has got a hand up, so I'd like to go to her if you've nothing more to say on that. Yeah, that's great, then. Brilliant. Corinda. Hi, um, my question is for Trudy. It's kind of like a two-parter. Um, it's purely for Trudy just because um, you're a politician, Trudy, and I know that. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong with these statistics. But um, on the 20th of April this year, no, last year, sorry, um, the government set a very ambitious target to reduce the carbon emissions by 78% from the 1990 levels. And given that um, burning fossil fuels and coal being a fossil fuel um, emits 90% of the world's CO2 emissions, do you really think it's viable for this to go ahead? The second part of my question is because you talked about the steelworks earlier. Um, do you think, and has it been considered about carbon, um, carbon, carbon sequestration and that being able to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere? Has that been considered at all to reduce the amount of carbon that it's emitting? 
Okay. Great question. I mean, first question, the answer to that is a yes, because of all the reasons that I've already um, explained over the last hour, I suppose. But the second question, carbon capture, carbon sequestration will be really important, not least for energy um, generation and electricity generation because we know that we're going to be needing about 40 gigawatts of nuclear by 2050, but that's probably only a third of the energy mix that we'll need. We'll also depend on about a third um, of uh, renewable energy to produce our energy. And, and also I think it's important to recognize that electricity is only about 17% of our energy requirement at the moment. You've also got to bear in mind transportation, heat, cooling, the different aspects that um, form the energy mix of our country. So with that in mind, if, um, as is stated, there will be a third of fossil fuels st still being used, then carbon capture will be absolutely essential in order to not emit the gases that are so harmful for the environment. And it's really fascinating, actually. I've been speaking to EDF, um, who've diversified divested from um, fossil fuels. They are purely nuclear and renewables now. And they were explaining that uh, the carbon catch, it's almost like a huge hoover uh, vacuum um, that will suck in the carbon and then put it through a process, eventually becomes a liquid, and then it can go back underground in the existing pipe networks that we've utilized from oil and gas rigs in the North Sea and off the Merseyside uh, coast as well. So it's really, really fascinating. And these are the jobs of the future. You know, artificial intelligence, robotics, mining without humans actually in the mine because we can utilize robotics. We at Sellafield tackle the most hazardous environments and I'm we do it without humans. Anything. And it, that's, the, doing... that's the kind of future. Okay, thank you. Rebecca, I know you were desperate to get in there. Thank you. Karenza, you asked about the 78% reduction. And I mean, this is absolutely what my work focuses on, how we can meet our climate goals. And the at the moment, the government has committed itself to those targets, but it does not have the policies in place to meet them yet. Um, those will happen, we really hope, over the next uh, year. We hope an announcement will happen before November. Um, and there will be stuff happening on steel, which will mean that this mine is not needed anymore. Um, in terms of carbon capture, this is a really important debate, basically, and I've looked into this very closely. Um, we do need carbon capture, but it's difficult and expensive at the moment. It's not proven commercially. Um, we need it to offset the carbon emissions from things where there is not any technological alternative. We have alternatives for electricity, we have renewables and nuclear. Um, we have alternatives uh, for transport, electric vehicles and so on. We have alternatives for steel. We don't have alternatives for agriculture or um, so for greenhouse gases from um, cows and sheep essentially, um, and we don't have alternatives at the moment for aviation. So to the extent that we can use carbon capture, it has to be for those two sectors, aviation and um, agriculture. And that is pretty widely accepted and that follows uh, the Committee on Climate Change. Um, you know, so, so if we do get carbon capture, we shouldn't be using it for steel. Thank you, Rebecca. And uh, unfortunately, we're just about out of time now. That one and a half hours has passed remarkably quickly. 